Okay, hello, uh, my name is Derek and I'm your instructor for our machine learning course. Um, and in this video, we're going to be continuing talking about uh, classification tasks. So we're going to extend the uh, ideas that we talked about in the previous video to the multi-class um, case here. So all that means is that uh, instead of trying to predict a binary label, true, false, or whatever, um, uh, we might have, it's still going to be a discrete category that we want our output to be, but uh, we have more than, you know, uh, uh, two possibilities. So the, we already saw, like, the MNIST uh, training data set is, is multi-class inherently because there's ten digits, ten categories that we want to predict, okay? So that's all we mean by multi-class, all right? Um, uh, we'll look a little bit at kind of the error analysis, so basically the confusion matrix um, and some things you might do to make it easier to work with confusion matrix when you have multiple classes. And then we'll talk about multi-label and multi-output classification, um, which is really just the idea instead of having one output, you know, uh, we, we have multiple outputs, okay? So that's, that's really all these are. This video probably won't be too long. So, uh, Although um, uh, in, in this uh, second part of this video, some of the cross-validation takes quite a bit of time, so I'll probably be pausing the video and, and restarting quite a bit here to um, uh, showing these examples. But I did want to run them. So, um, All right. So we've already mentioned that binary um, classification is common. Uh, many problems um, are naturally, you know, binary, or many times we want to simplify and just concentrate on the most important aspect of a problem, so a true-false kind of question. Um, so we've already mentioned this before, and we'll kind of show an example of this. So one way that you can extend to the multi-class case um, is just to build multiple classifiers, all right? So... Um, So th there's two different um, basic ways that we can uh, do that. So we can use the um, um, the strategy where we train a binary classifier for each digit, like we did in the previous um, video. So we train a, a five classifier and a six classifier. Uh, so, so this is called a one versus all strategy. So in that case, you'd have just ten classifiers, right? Um, and then, in order to come up with your final answer, you would look the pick the one whose decision had the highest score. So the one that that output the the highest um, um, score that they gave that, that the probability that it was its class, you would pick that as your winner, right? So that, that's what a one versus all strategy is. Um, so more complicated, we, we can build um, a classifier for every pair. So zeros, ones, zeros, twos, so on, and then ones and twos, ones and threes. All right. So in that case, you have a lot more classifiers that you build. So instead of, uh, you know, so if I have in classes, the one versus all, I have to build in classifiers. So now you actually need about n squared. You need n times n minus 1 divided by 2 classifiers to do this. Because if you build a 0 versus 1, you, uh, you don't have to build a 1 versus 0. So that's both of those. So it's not exactly n squared. It's a little bit less than that, but it's, it's close to n squared. So if you work it out for the the MNIST with 10 classes, you would need to build, train 45 different classifiers, right? Um, so, so yeah, like it says here, um, it, if you use the, the one versus one strategy, you would run it through all of the classifiers that you build, um, and you, was, you would pick the one that won the most duels, okay? So, so one of those, you know, you're, you're, you know, you've got to get, you're going to have one versus all the other classifiers. You're going to have, you have uh, two versus all the other classifiers, and one of those is going to win more than anybody else, right? And that would become your winner. Right? Um, so these have advantages and disadvantages. The, the first strategy scales linearly in the size of n, so you know, you you only need n classifier to build, train n classifiers. Uh, to do one versus all. Um, so, um, but but yeah, the the one versus um, all can uh, it, 
perform poorly sometimes. It's only using kind of part of the data set. So, 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 so there are reasons why you might want to do the one versus all. Uh, or sorry, the one, one versus um, um, one, what the one-on-one -on -one strategy. So. But, you know, um, I mean, if you're using the, the scikit-learn framework, um, you can do... You, can do both of these and it will kind of set that up for you behind the scenes, right? So you can um, specify one versus all or one versus uh, one-on-one -on -one, um, strategies. So. Um, okay, so um, we can build a multi-class classifier uh, relatively easily. So um, if, if, again, if we just, by, by default, um, For most of these classifiers, if if, if you give it a, a multi-class um, um, output like Y train is right now, so so if you give it a multi-class output, it'll train a multi-class classifier, right? And by default, it'll usually use the um, uh, the one versus all, right? So so the the default if we're using a stochastic gradient descent classifier um, is to use one versus all. Um, so once we train our classifier, um, we can roughly see how well it does to predict um, on our dig digits using a prediction function, right? So, you know, again, like I said, I'm going to have to keep pausing and, and restarting this video. So you can see already that... that um, um, it will take significantly longer to do this because, you know, even when we're doing the one versus all and we're only training 10 classifiers, um, you know, the, our, our data set has 60,000 images um, um, and we have to train 10 classifiers on it to, to get our um, one versus all um, multi-class classifier set up here. So let's pause here. So once the stochastic gradient descent classifier finishes, you know we can try out the predictions. Uh, it, it works, you know, although it, it often gets the uh, the prediction wrong for the first class. So, so if we ask for digit zero, you know, it gets it wrong here. So remember that was a five, right? Um, if we want to, um, you know, we, we can access the um, the, the raw. Um, Decision scores, right? So, so, so since this is a multi-class classifier, there's actually ten classifiers since it did a one versus all. So, so if we ask for the decision function, um, these were the ten um, uh, scores that it had for each of the ten digits, um, and it was predicting um, a three. So zero, one, two, three. So that should be the highest one. So you can see it had the highest score there, right? So these really aren't probabilities. It's just some kind of a raw score that, that's happening here, and it's going to take the highest one. So argmax is a useful function. So this will tell us the index of the argmax. So this will basically correspond to the class label um, the, of, of the one that was the highest in this case. You know, so, you know, of course, our labels don't always nicely line up like this, but, but yeah, I mean, our, our zero label um, corresponds to the zero digit, the one label to the one digit, um, and so on in this case. So, so we can directly use that to, um, um, to, to pull that out. Um, but, but yeah, in the more general case, you'd have to use the, um, the, the, the classes um, to, to, to take the the one with the highest um, and, and pull out your like class label so um, so yeah we can we can force uh, one on one or one versus one um, usually for these um, so so th there's wrappers um, in scikit-learn around this. So, so if we want a one versus one classification using the stochastic gradient descent, we, we can wrap it around uh, like that and specify one versus one. So again, in this case, we're going to get 45 classifiers, right? So we'll have to let that um, train for a bit. Okay, so um, we we finished our one versus one. Um, so as we discussed, um, you know, if you look at the estimators 
um, that end up in this one versus one. Um, there's actually 45 of them, so I can get the length of that. Um, so, so training other classifiers is, uh, is just as easy, right? Um, so again, you know, it, using the scikit-learn framework, if you had to, you can imagine, so if you needed to implement this by hand, you, you would have to write all the code to, you know, uh, set up all these multiple classifiers uh, and train them all individually. Um, and then whenever you need to do predictions, you'd have to, uh, run the input in through all of the the train classifiers and get all of the outputs uh, and then implement your mechanisms to you know pick the highest one uh, and return that as your prediction uh, you know all those kinds of things right um, so So some um, classifier, I mean, th there are differences on this, so, so it depends on the, the classifier that you're using. So some classifiers are inherently multi-class. So sometimes it, it, it doesn't support multi-classification. The algorithm um, at, its, at its base doesn't really support multi-class classification uh, directly. So that's when you have to do the one versus all or the one one on one. Uh, kind of setup, but but other classifiers can uh, inherently, as part of the algorithm, support that. Like like random force does that. Okay, so. <clears throat> um, but uh, you know, again, a lot of that the the time, you if you're using the scikit learn framework, you don't have to know that it, um, um, because if you fit a multi class and it doesn't inherently support that, it will. Uh, I think usually by default it'll do the the the. Um, one versus all, so it'll build a one versus all classifier for you, right? Um, or if it inherently supports that, then there's no problem, like like the random forest here. So, um, so in this case, again, um, uh, you, the, the the default is going to be like a one versus all. So um, if we ask to predict for this random forest classifier, uh, we get something. In this case, the algorithm has things. The the prediction scores are more like probabilities. So we'll see that the, the, probably the sum of these ends up summing up to one, um, and one of these is clearly the winner. So the, um, the, the class five here, which was the correct one for this uh, digit this, this time, had a 90% probability with 8% uh, that it was a three, which makes sense because there's some, some similarity between the threes and the five. So. Um, all right, so at this point, you know, we, we've, we've only been training our classifiers on the multi-class classification. So like we did in the previous video, um, if we want to assess the accuracy, though, we should, we should, ex we should um, um, evaluate its accuracy on, on data it hasn't been trained with. So we should do some sort of cross-validation. Uh, scoring to do that, okay? So these, if you want to run cross-validation, of course, these will take even longer because not only does it have to train the multi-class classifier, but it has to train it multiple times. So we're going to train it multiple times this time, um, holding back some of the, the data in a uh, cross-validation training set so it can um, assess the accuracy uh, on the held back validation data, right? So, um, so yeah, if we want to get a true picture of how stochastic gradient descent does, um, we can um, uh, do a cross-validation on it to see how accurate it is on data it isn't trained with, which we'll go ahead and do. Okay, so um, once we uh, train uh, and cross-validate um, our stochastic gradient descent on the multi-class, uh, so notice that... Um, I mean, the performance has gone down, um, which shouldn't surprise you if you think about it, because uh, it, it's a more difficult task now. So we're, we're not trying to do the binary classifier, five, not five, but we're trying to, to uh, in general, predict any of, of the 10 digits, 10 labels here, right? So another thing that maybe you should have pointed out um, uh, earlier here, though, is that the, the, test, the, the task is definitely more difficult. So think about the, the baseline random guesser or uh, always guessing five, right? 
So where, whereas before, um, you know, guessing, always guessing not five would get you a 90% accuracy. Here, there, there's no random guesser or baseline guesser that will give you better than 10% accuracy, okay? So whether you're always guessing a five, you know, only 10% of, of any digit um, it only represents approximately 10% of the, um, the data that we're going to be testing with here, right? Uh, or you get the same result with a random guesser because, you know, you, if, if, if each digit is equally likely um, and if you just guess at random, you should get it right about 10% of the time, all right? But that means that, that yeah, accuracies of, of 85%, um, 86% here um, are actually kind of much better than, than, than when we were getting the 95% uh, when the baseline was, was about a 90% accuracy that you could expect, right? So, so the task is much tougher here, um, and, um, um, uh, 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 and, and we're, you know, we're not doing too bad, although, you know, we can do much better. So the best known algorithms on MNIST can achieve almost perfect. They get 99.99% um, um, accuracy, right? There are a few really problematic cases that are probably mislabels in the MNIST data set, right? But, uh, but yeah, you can get pretty close to, to getting almost um, perfect accuracy on validation data or training data with, with some of the best known algorithms. So. Um, so, I mean, you know, we can definitely improve on that, right? So, so 85% really isn't, 86% really isn't all that great. Uh, here, so we could try scaling the inputs. We've talked a little bit about that before. Here, the 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 um, the, the the pixel images data actually ranges from zero to two fifty five. So I, I may have, I may have said zero to one before, but um, but yeah, they, they're actually kind of pixel. They're, they're unsigned integer values, um, uh, which is typical for like a pixel value. Um, so um, if we rescale. So, so, I mean, again, that can be problematic for some of the reasons that we've discussed. Uh, you know, here, since the labels are in a range from, like, uh, 0 to 10, um, but um, um, the, the pixel values are 0 to 55, we might get some improvements if we scale a bit. So let's scale and try that out. Okay, um, yeah, so you should see that uh, probably did improve that a little bit. So uh, we reach 89, maybe 90% accuracy on cross-validation um, <clears throat> when we uh, do a little bit of the, uh, the scaling there. So. Um, so, but if we really want to improve our multi-class classifier to get it up to that more like that 99% range, um, we're going to have to, you know, kind of do some error analysis. And, and we want to start with confusion matrix again, okay? So, um, <clears throat> so let's um, um, uh, train um, <clears throat> and um, display out the confusion matrix from uh, training our, our stochastic gradient descent classifier again. All right. So again, the uh, the classifier in this case, the, the the sorry, the confusion matrix in this case. Um, it's going to be a 10 by 10 matrix, right? Because we've got um, 10 classes. So, um, so recall that, that rows are going to be the true label, um, and, and then the columns are going to be the, the prediction, okay? So. <clears throat> okay, so if you uh, train the SGD um, classifier, um, and um, use cross-validation, and then do the confusion matrix, you'll get something like this. Um, probably pretty much the same, if not exactly the same, result here. So, this is the same confusion matrix as we had for the binary case. Um, so the rows are the, I think I already mentioned, are um, the true labels here, and the columns are going to be our prediction. So, for example, if, if, if you want to find where, when... The cases where um, it was a one, but we actually predicted it was a two, so that would be in column uh, one, 
uh, row one, column two. So, so that's what these are. So this should be the zero. So case is where it's a zero, we predict a zero. And of course the diagonals are still going to be uh, where we got the things correct. <clears throat> so So with, with, with 10 classes, I mean, you can still maybe kind of print out a confusion matrix like this and comprehend it, right? Although it's going to be, already going to be kind of tough maybe to, to, to do pattern. I mean, we're visual animals, right? So, so like a table of numbers like this isn't necessarily going to be easy to pop things out, right? So, uh, and, and you can imagine, I mean, if you have 100 or 1,000 classes, I mean, you're not going to be able to work directly with the confusion matrix uh, anymore, right? At least not easily, right? So uh, normally what we want to do is turn to some sort of a visualization so, so to help us visualize better. So a, a common way to do that is to just um, um, uh, turn the, the numerical information into a, a graph. So in this case, color code it, right? Um, so already, I mean, you, could, you probably could have spotted it by, by looking at the numbers here, but, but, um, but it might be a little bit more obvious, although here, because, of course, our correct predictions are much higher in terms of absolute count than all the others, um, you know, so, so there's one thing we can see, like, for example, uh, our, our lowest prediction seems to be the fives, right? So, um, and we're, we seem to be doing best here with the ones. That was about the highest, okay? But, again, that might be a little bit misleading because these are absolute counts, right? And, and as we already noticed, um, I mean, we don't have exactly an even breakdown of, of these, um, you know, so we don't have an equal number of five. In fact, fives seem like there might have been quite a few less of these as examples than the others, right? So, you know, um, if you want to compare your, your correct predictions, it might be better to divide these by the total of, of classes that we had for our, our validation data, right? So then you could be comparing apples to apples. Um, and in that case, maybe, you know, we're not quite so low on, on five as we are with the others. Right? Uh, but the other, since, since these are so big, it tends to wash out the other information, so it's hard to see patterns anywhere else. Although you can, like, like I already pointed out, something seems to be going on with the eight. So remember, the column represents uh, the place where we predicted, um, and, and we're predicting eights a lot, uh, and for, for some reason, more than others, uh, and incorrectly, right? So... <coughs> so, but yeah, if we really want to focus on the errors, we could, um, so, oh, like I said, um, um, so, so for that first thing, we could divide by our row sums, and that would uh, make these all relative, so instead of absolute counts, these would all be, um, like a, a percentage, um, based on the, the total number that we had in each one, right? So we can do that kind of first of all, right? And get our confusion matrix. Um, and another thing, though, like I was saying, we might want to both do that and also kind of just fill this with zeros because um, um, so, so we can look at this and, and determine how they're doing relative to each other, but, but we could maybe get rid of that and then just look at the incorrect predictions to better see patterns, right? So, so one way we could do that is just fill the diagonals with zeros and, and redisplay, right? So there, I mean, the eights definitely pop out, you know, and we've got some others here, so um, with with the fives, um, so so when it was correctly a five and we're predicting a three, and when it was a, a, actually a three and we're predicting a five, right? So that uh, probably is not too surprising because of the similarities between threes and fives, just the, the, the line is going to be on one side or the other, <coughs> right, connecting the, the top part, right? But yeah, we might do that. But 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 you know, this is definitely telling us for our stochastic gradient descent. Um, <coughs> something's going on with eight. I mean, in fact, it even looks like something incorrect is going on. So, um, and here uh, five. Well, fives and eights. Maybe it's not too surprising, but there was lots of those, right? Right. So again, those are also pretty similar. So anyway, um, um, uh, so I won't go into any more analysis of this, but but 
but this this is usually the, the first um, step towards beginning to think about how can we improve the classifier. So what do we need to do, right? So what's going wrong, and and um, 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 what things can we try to improve our um, classifier here, right? Um, so. You know, just continuing on from the examples from the, the textbook, the, the textbook kind of ignores the eights and then says, well, um, uh, of course, we have some, some, some problem here with threes and fives, right? Um, and so, so maybe we can do something about that, for example. <clears throat> so, you know, you might want to actually pull out the instances and examine them closer. So pull out our threes and fives, you know, and look at them, things like that. So I'll let you read through kind of that sort of thing, right? <coughs> All right, so that's the basics of, of multi-class classification. So then, um, I'm not going to spend much time on these last two things. So um, these are really the same thing, so multi-label or multi-output. Okay, so in both cases, all we're talking about is instead of, of having one, so for each input, just having one Output, right? Um, so, so it's often the case that um, that lots of times we have problems where our inputs we're going to have multiple outputs, so multiple labels that we might want to predict. Okay, and you can't just build separate classifiers, right? So, so that's that's one approach. But if the inputs are exactly the same, sometimes there can be advantages by using the same classifier but having it output two separate labels, right? Um, and Scikit-Learn um, supports being able to do this sort of multi-label um, classification, right? And really, I, I don't know if this is common usage, but the only difference between multi-label and multi-output that our, as our textbook defines these is, is, so apparently some people, I hadn't really run across this convention, but some people call it multi-label classification when you have multiple outputs, but all your outputs are going to be a, a binary classifier, okay? So that, that's a slightly more restricted case. And then the most general case then is when you have multiple outputs and the outputs can be multi-class, okay? So, so if we have multiple outputs, uh, but they're all binary, so an example of this is we might have want to have two labels, uh, so, so have detect, so again, the input would be the same, but we want to detect if the digit is large, if it's a 7, 8, or 9, which are the three largest values, um, and we might also want to detect if it's an odd digit, what the, the, the set 1, 3, 5, 7, okay? So we can make two labels y for each of those. So, so one of these is just going to be for where all the digits, the digits that are greater than or equal to 7 to get the large ones. Um, and, and then, you know, we can use a modulus to, to, to be true for the, the digits that are um, that are odd, basically. So, so yeah, if you divide by 2 and you have a remainder of 1, it's an odd digit, right? Um, <clears throat> And then again, um, uh, and then notice, so all we do in order to set this up for scikit-learn is we just create an array where we basically append our, our two label outputs um, together here, right? So, you know, again, if you were writing this by hand, it, it would be much more complicated to set this up. But, but, but scikit-learn, the framework, basically does support the sort of multi-output, multi-label um, directly, so so you just give it a, a, a multi-output label instead of a a, a single um, uh, output that you want to predict, right? And it will train, it will do the things it needs to do to, to build the classifier to output that, right? So here we're using another classifier. We we got we, we stopped using the the, sta the stochastic gradient descent. We'll use a K neighbors. Uh, classifier again. Most all of these we will later on look at more details of of the. Uh, implementation and how these different kinds of classifiers and regressors work uh, later on in this class, right? <coughs> so we can train our classifier as before, use it to predict, um, and um, also, you know, run a cross-validation in order to to get a general idea of how well it's doing. Um, so in this case, though, we would expect. Uh, we, you know, um, um, our, our cross-validation, we've got actually two sort of sorts of outputs, so we would have 
two separate confusion matrix matrices. So, but in this case, both of our confusion matrices are going to be binary, right? Um, and we can compute F1 scores and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll let both of those run, and we'll come back when those are done. So um, that'll take quite a while to do. I had a warning there about that. So, but the result of that is, um, as I mentioned, you know, you'd probably want to evaluate each one individually, but you can do something like, um, say, compute the F1 score and take the average of the F1 scores to get kind of an idea of how it's working um, on this um, this multi-label classification. So. Um, so finally, then, is a quick illustration of the most general case. So this is kind of a common task in, like, neural networks. Um, so these are <coughs> similar to so-called autoencoders. So, so normally what you do is you train on clean versions of, a, of some kind of a pattern, like our images here. Um, and then you might feed it noisy versions. And, and so the task is that, you know, so the, in, the size of the inputs is the same as the size of the output. So, so here, this is multi... Uh, output because we're outputting all, what was it, 28 by 28, so all 784 um, pixels as outputs, so it's, it's a large number of outputs, and each one um, can be a value in the range from 0 to 255, right, so so, so each one is, is alt also multi-class, so this is our most general um, idea here, right. So um, I actually already ran these, so here's an example of what the, the noisy input might look like. Um, Um, so here, you know, we're just showing another classifier. This one's significantly faster to, to train, even though this is a much kind of more complicated task, but, but you can kind of see how it works. Um, um, if, if you train it, um, uh, you know, so basically what we were doing is we were training it. The, the input was the noisy data and the output was the clean data, right? So now if we give it, um, um, some noisy digit, um, it'll try and clean up. So you can compare that to the actual, you know, target clean data there. So, okay, so that's basically it for the ideas of classification, both binary classification in the previous video and multi-class classification. Um, and here we covered uh, these things. So especially probably the most important part is, you know, um, uh, that you know that, that you even for the multi-class case you, you want to do the same sort of thing in order to be able to analyze the performance so you'll probably want to start by looking at the confusion matrix for example um, and then you know we discussed that you can do you know multiple outputs um, and those outputs could either be like a binary classification or even the, the most general case so they could you have multiple outputs and they're multi-class so Okay, that's it for this video and this chapter, and I will see you guys all in the next video then.